This is from my podcast, Down to Sleep, where I read books to help you get a good night's rest. You can listen for free here, Spotify, or other apps. Come and support the podcast on Patreon and get a bonus episode every single week. Chapter 1. Story of the Door Mr. Utterson, the lawyer, was a man of a rugged countenance that was never lighted by a smile. Cold, scanty, and embarrassed in discourse, backward in sentiment, lean, long, dusty, dreary, and yet somehow lovable. At friendly meetings, and when the wine was to his taste, something eminently human beaconed from his eye, something indeed which never found its way into his talk, but which spoke not only in those silent symbols of the after-dinner face, but more often and loudly in the acts of his life. He was austere with himself, drank gin when he was alone, to mortify a taste for vintages, and though he enjoyed the theatre, he had not crossed the doors of one for twenty years. But he had an approved tolerance for others, sometimes wondering, almost with envy at the high pressure of spirits involved in their misdeeds, and in any extremity inclined to help rather than to reprove. I incline to Cain's heresy, he used to say quaintly. I let my brother go to the devil in his own way. In this character, it was frequently his fortune to be the last reputable acquaintance and the last good influence in the lives of downgoing men. And to such as these, so long as they came about his chambers, he never marked a shade of change in his demeanour. No doubt the feat was easy to Mr. Utterson, for he was undemonstrative at the best, and even his friendship seemed to be founded in a similar catholicity of good nature. It is the mark of a modest man to accept his friendly circle ready-made from the hands of opportunity, and that was the lawyer's way. His friends were those of his own blood or those whom he had known the longest. His affections, like ivy, were the growth of time. They implied no aptness in the object. Hence, no doubt the bond that united him to Mr. Richard Enfield, his distant kinsman, the well-known man about town. It was a nut to crack for many. What these two could see in each other, or what subjects they could find in common. It was reported by those who encountered them in their Sunday walks that they said nothing, looked singularly dull, and would hail with obvious relief the appearance of a friend. For all that, the two men put the greatest store by these excursions, counted them the chief jewel of each week, and not only set aside occasions of pleasure, but even resisted the calls of business, that they might enjoy them uninterrupted. It chanced on one of these rambles that their way led them down a by-street in a busy quarter of London. The street was small and what is called quiet, but it drove a thriving trade on the weekdays. The inhabitants were all doing well, it seemed, and all emulously hoping to do better still, laying out the surplus of their grains in coquetry, so that the shop front stood along that thoroughfare with an air of invitation, like rows of smiling saleswomen. Even on Sunday, when it veiled its more florid charms and lay comparatively empty of passage, the street shone out in contrast to its dingy neighbourhood, like a fire in a forest, with its freshly painted shutters and well-polished brasses and general cleanliness and gaiety of note, instantly caught and pleased the eye of the passenger. Two doors from one corner, on the left hand going east, the line was broken by the entry of a court and just at that point a certain sinister block of building thrust forward its gable on the street. It was two stories high, showed no window, nothing but a door on the lower story, and a blind forehead of discoloured wall on the upper, a bore in every feature the marks of prolonged and sordid negligence. The door, which was equipped with neither bell nor knocker, was blistered and disdained. Tramps slouched into the recess and struck matches on the panels. Children kept shop upon the steps. The schoolboy had tried his knife on the mouldings, and for close on a generation, no one had appeared to drive away these random visitors or to repair their ravages. Mr. Enfield and the lawyer were on the other side of the by-street, but when they came abreast of the entry, the former lifted up his cane and pointed. "'Did you ever remark that door?' he asked. And when his companion had replied in the affirmative, "'It's connected in my mind,' added he with a very odd story. Indeed, said Mr. Utterson with a slight change of voice. And what was that? Well, it was this way, returned Mr. Enfield. I was coming home from some place at the end of the world, about three o'clock of a black winter morning. 
and my way lay through part of town where there was literally nothing to be seen but lamps. Street after street, and all the folks asleep, street after street, all lighted up, as if for a procession, and all as empty as a church. Till at last I got into that state of mind when a man listens, and listens and begins to long for the sight of a policeman. All at once I saw two figures, one a little man who was stumping along eastward at a good walk, and the other a girl of maybe eight or ten who was running as hard as she was able down a cross street. Well, sir, the two ran into one another naturally enough at the corner, and then came the horrible part of the thing, for the man trampled calmly over the child's body and left her screaming on the ground. It sounds nothing to hear, but it was hellish to see. It wasn't like a man, it was like some damn juggernaut. I gave a few halloa, who took to my heels and collared my gentleman, and I brought him back to where there was already quite a group about the screaming child. He was perfectly cool and made no resistance, but gave me one look, so ugly that it brought out the sweat on me, like running. The people who had turned out were the girl's own family, and pretty soon the doctor, for whom she had been sent, put in his appearance. Well, the child was not much the worse, more frightened, according to the sawbones, and there you might have supposed would be an end to it. But there was one curious circumstance. I'd taken a loathing to my gentleman at first sight, so had the child's family, which was only natural. But the doctor's case was what struck me. He was the usual cut-and-dry apothecary, of no particular age and colour, with a strong Edinburgh accent, and about as emotional as a bagpipe. Well, sir, he was like the rest of us. Every time he looked at my prisoner, I saw that sawbones turn sick and white with the desire to kill him. I knew what was in his mind, just as he knew what was in mine. And killing being out of the question, we did the next best. We told the man we could, and would make such a scandal out of this, as should make his name stink from one end of London to the other. If he had any friends or any credit, we undertook that we should lose them. And all the time, as we were pitching it in red hot, we were keeping the women off him as best we could, for they were as wild as harpies. I never saw a circle of such hateful faces. And there was the man in the middle, with a kind of black, sneering coolness. Frightened, too, I could see that, but carrying it off, sir, really like Satan. If you choose to make capital out of this accident, said he, I am naturally helpless. No gentleman but wishes to avoid a scene, says he. Name your figure. Well, we screwed him up to a hundred pounds for the child's family. He would have clearly liked to stick out, but there was something about the lot of us that meant mischief. And at last he struck. The next thing was to get the money, and where do you think he carried us but to that place with the door? Whipped out a key and went in. And presently came back with the matter of ten pounds in gold and a check for the balance, drawn payable to bearer and signed with a name that I can't mention, though it's one of the points of my story, but it was a name at least very well known, and often printed. The figure was stiff, but the signature was good for more than that if it was only genuine. I took the liberty of pointing out to my gentleman that the whole business looked apocryphal, and that a man does not, in real life, walk into a cellar door at four in the morning and come out with another man's check for close upon a hundred pounds. He was quite easy and sneering. Set your mind at rest, says he, I will stay with you till the bank's open and cash the check myself. So we all set off, the doctor, the child's father, our friend, myself, and passed the rest of the night in my chambers. And next day, when we had breakfasted, went in a body to the bank, gave in the check myself, and said I had every reason to believe it was a forgery. Not a bit of it. The check was genuine. Tut, tut, said Mr. Utterson. I see you feel as I do, said Mr. Enfield. Yes, it's a bad story. For my man was a fellow that nobody could have to do with, a really damnable man. And the person that drew the check is the very pink of the proprieties. Celebrated, too, and what makes it worse... One of your fellows do do what they call good. Blackmail, I suppose, an honest man paying through the nose for some of the capers of his youth. Blackmail house is what I call the place with the door. In consequence, though even that, you know, is far from explaining all. He added, and with the words fell into a vein of musing. From this, when he was recalled by Mr. Utterson, asking rather suddenly, and you don't know if the drawer of the track lives on, a likely place, isn't it, returned Mr. Enfield, but I happen to have noticed his address. He lives in some square or other. And you never asked about the place with the door, said Mr. Utterson. 
No, sir. I had a delicacy, was the reply. I feel very strongly about putting questions. It partakes too much of the style of the day of judgment. You start a question, and it's like starting a stone. You sit quietly on the top of a hill. Away the stone goes, starting others, and presently some bland old bird, the last you would have thought of, is knocked on the head in his own back garden, and the family have to change their name. No, sir, I make it a rule of mine. The more it looks like Queer Street, the less I talk. A very good rule, too, said the lawyer. But I have studied the place for myself, continued Mr. Enfield. It seems scarcely a house. There is no other door, and nobody goes in or out of that one, but once in a great while the gentleman of my adventure. There are three windows looking on the court on the first floor, none below. The windows are always shut, but they're clean. And then there's a chimney which is generally smoking, so somebody must live there. And yet it's not so sure, for the buildings are so packed together about the court that it's hard to say where one ends and another begins. The pair walked on again for a while in silence, and then, Enfield, said Mr. Utterson, that's a good rule of yours. Yes, I think it is, returned Enfield. But for all of that, continued the lawyer, there's one point I want to ask. I want to ask the name of the man who walked over the child. Well, said Mr. Enfield, I can't see what harm it would do. It was a man of the name of Hyde, mm, said Mr. Utterson sort of man is he to see? He's not easy to describe. There's something wrong with his appearance, something displeasing, something downright detestable. I never saw a man I so disliked, and yet I scarce know why. He must be deformed somewhere. He gives a strong feeling of deformity, although I couldn't specify the point. He's an extraordinary-looking man, and yet I really can name nothing out of the way. No, sir, I can make no hand of it. I can't describe him. And it's not want of memory, for I declare I can see him this moment. Mr. Utterson again walked some way in silence, and obviously under a weight of consideration. You sure he used a key? he inquired at last. My dear sir, began Enfield, surprised out of himself. Yes, I know. I, I know it must seem strange. The fact is, if I do not ask you the name of the other party, it's because I know it already. You see, Richard, your tale has gone home. If you have been inexact in any point, you had better correct it. "'I think you might have warned me,' returned the other with a touch of sullenness. "'But I had been pedantically exact, as you call it. "'The fellow had a key, and what's more, he has it still. "'I saw him use it not a week ago.' "'Mr. Utterson sighed deeply, but never said a word, "'and the young man presently resumed. "'Here's another lesson to say nothing,' said he. "'I'm ashamed of my long tongue. "'Let us make a bargain, never to refer to this again.' "'With all my heart,' said the lawyer.' I shake hands on that, Richard. Chapter 2 The Search for Mr. Hyde That evening Mr. Utterson came home to his bachelor house in sombre spirits, and sat down to dinner without relish. It was his custom of a Sunday, when this meal was over, to sit close by the fire, a volume of some dry divinity on his reading desk until the clock of the neighbouring church rang out the hour of twelve, when he would go soberly and gratefully to bed. On this night, however, as soon as the cloth was taken away, he took up a candle and went into his business room. There he opened his safe, took from the most private part of it a document endorsed on the envelope as Dr. Jekyll's will, and sat down with a clouded brow to study its contents. The will was holograph, for Mr. Utterson, though he took charge of it now that it was made, had refused to lend the least assistance in the making of it. It provided not only that, in the case of the decease of Dr. Henry Jekyll, all his possessions were to pass into the hands of his friend and benefactor, Edward Hyde, but that in case of Dr. Jekyll's disappearance or unexplained absence for any period exceeding three calendar months, the said Edward Hyde should step into the said Henry Jekyll's shoes without further delay and free from any burden or obligation beyond the payment of a few small sums to the members of the doctor's household. This document had long been the lawyer's eyesore. It offended him, both as a lawyer and as a lover of the sane and customary sides of life, to whom the fanciful was immodest, and hitherto it was his ignorance of Mr. Hyde that had swelled his indignation. Now, by a sudden turn, it was his knowledge. It was already bad enough when the name was but a name, of which he could learn no more. It was worse when it began to be clothed upon with detestable attributes. 
and out of the shifting, insubstantial mists that had so long baffled his eye, there leaped up the sudden, definite presentment of a fiend. I thought it was madness, he said, as he replaced the obnoxious paper in the safe. And now I begin to fear it is disgrace. With that, he blew out his candle, put on a great coat, and set forth in the direction of Cavendish Square. That citadel of medicine, where his friend the great Dr. Lanyon had his house and received his crowding patients. If anyone knows, it will be Lanyon, he thought. The solemn butler knew and welcomed him. He was subjected to no stage of delay, but ushered direct from the door to the dining room, where Dr. Lanyon sat alone over his wine. This was a hearty, healthy, dapper, red-faced gentleman, with a shock of hair prematurely white, and a boisterous and decided manner. At the sight of Mr. Utterson, he sprang up from his chair and welcomed him with both hands. The geniality, as was the way of the man, was somewhat theatrical to the eye, but it reposed on genuine feeling. For these two were old friends, old mates both at school and college, both thorough respecters of themselves and of each other, and what does not always follow, men who thoroughly enjoyed each other's company. After a little rambling talk, the lawyer led up to the subject, which was so disagreeably preoccupied in his mind. "'I suppose, Lanyon,' said he, "'you and I must be the two oldest friends that Henry Jekyll has.' "'I wish the friends were younger,' chuckled Dr. Lanyon, "'but I suppose we are. And "'What of that? I see little of him now.' "'Indeed,' said Utterson. "'I thought you had a bond of common interest.' "'We had,' was the reply. "'But it is more than ten years since Henry Jekyll became too fanciful for me. "'He began to go wrong, wrong in mind.' Though, of course, I continue to take an interest in him for old sake's sake, as they say. I see, and I have seen devilish little of the man. Such unscientific balderdash, added the doctor, flushing suddenly purple, would have estranged Damon and Pythias. This little spirit of temper was somewhat of a relief to Mr. Utterson. They've only differed on some point of science, he thought, and being a man of no scientific passions except in the matter of conveyancing, he even added, "'It's nothing worse than that.' He gave his friend a few seconds to recover his composure, and then approached the question that he had come to put. "'Did you ever come across a protégé of his? One Hyde?' he asked. "'Hyde?' repeated Lanyon. "'No, never heard of him since my time.' That was the amount of information that the lawyer carried back with him to the great dark bed, on which he tossed to and fro until the small hours of the morning began to grow large. It was a night of little ease to his toiling mind, toiling in mere darkness and besieged by questions. Six o'clock struck on the bells of the church that was so conveniently near to Mr. Utterson's dwelling, and still he was digging at the problem. Hitherto it had touched him on the intellectual side alone, but now his imagination also was engaged, or rather enslaved and as he lay and tossed in the gross darkness of the night in the curtained room, Mr. Enfield's tale went by before his mind in a scroll of lighted pictures. He would be aware of the great field of lamps of a nocturnal city, then of the figure of a man walking swiftly, then of a child running from the doctors. And then these met, and that human juggernaut trod the child down and passed on regardless of her screams, or else he would see a room in a rich house where his friend lay asleep, dreaming and smiling at his dreams. And then the door of that room would be opened, the curtains of the bed plucked apart, the sleeper recalled, and lo, there would be, standing by his side, a figure to whom power was given. And even at that dead hour he must rise and do its bidding. The figure in these two phases haunted the lawyer all night, and if at any time he dozed over it was but to see it glide more stealthily through sleeping houses, or move the more swiftly and still the more swiftly even to dizziness, through wider labyrinths of lamp-lighted city, and at every street corner crush a child and leave her screaming. And still the figure had no face by which he might know it. Even in his dreams it had no face or one that baffled him and melted before his eyes. 
and thus it was that there sprang up and grew apace in the lawyer's mind a singularly strong, almost inordinate curiosity to behold the features of the real Mr. Hyde. If he could but once set eyes on him, he thought the mystery would lighten and perhaps roll altogether away, as was the habit of mysterious things when well examined. He might see a reason for his friend's strange preference or bondage, call it which you please, and even for the startling clause of the will. At least it would be a face worth seeing, the face of a man who was without bowels of mercy, a face which had but to show itself to raise up in the mind of the unimpressionable Enfield a spirit of enduring hatred. From that time forward, Mr. Utterson began to haunt the door in the by-street of shops, in the morning before office hours, at noon when business was plenty and time scarce, and at night under the face of the fogged city moon, by all lights and at all hours of solitude or concourse, the lawyer was to be found on his chosen post. If he be Mr. Hyde, he thought, I shall be Mr. Seek, and at last his patience was rewarded. It was a fine, dry night, a frost in the air, the streets as clean as a ballroom floor, the lamps, unshaken by any wind, drawing a regular pattern of light and shadow. By ten o'clock, when the shops were closed, the by-street was very solitary, and in spite of the low growl of London from all round, very silent. Small sounds carried far, domestic sounds out of the houses were clearly audible on either side of the roadway. The rumour of the approach of any passenger preceded him by a long time. Mr. Utterson had been some minutes at his post, when he was aware of an odd, light footstep drawing near. In the course of his nightly patrols he had long grown accustomed to the quaint effect with which the footfalls of a single person, while he is still a great way off, suddenly spring out distinct from the vast hum and clatter of the city. Yet his attention had never before been so sharply and decisively arrested, and it was with a strong, superstitious provision of success that he withdrew into the entry of the court. The steps drew swiftly nearer and swelled out suddenly louder as they turned the end of the street. The lawyer, looking forth from the entry, could soon see what manner of man he had to deal with. He was small and very plainly dressed, and the look of him, even at that distance, went somehow strongly against the watcher's inclination. But he made straight for the door, crossing the roadway to save time, and as he came he drew a key from his pocket like one approaching home. Mr. Utterson stepped out and touched him on the shoulder as he passed. Mr. Hyde, I think. Mr. Hyde shrank back with a hissing intake of the breath. But his fear was only momentary, and though he did not look the lawyer in the face, he answered coolly enough. That is my name, what do you want? I see you are going in, returned the lawyer. I'm an old friend of Dr. Jekyll's, Mr. Utterson of Gaunt Street. You must have heard of my name, and meeting you so conveniently, I thought you might admit me. You will not find Dr. Jekyll. He is from home, replied Mr. Hyde, blowing in the key, and suddenly, but still without looking up. How did you know me? he asked. On your side, said Mr. Utterson, will you do me a favour? With pleasure, replied the other. What shall it be? Will you let me see your face? asked the lawyer. Mr. Hyde appeared to hesitate, and then, as if upon some sudden reflection, fronted about with an air of defiance, and the pair stared at each other pretty fixedly for a few seconds. "'Now I shall know you again,' said Mr. Utterson. "'It may be useful.' "'Yes,' returned Mr. Hyde. "'It is as well we have met. You should have my address.' And he gave a number of a street in Soho, Good God, thought Mr. Utterson, can he too have been thinking of the will? But he kept his feelings to himself and only grunted in acknowledgement of the address. And now, said the other, how did you know me? By description, was the reply. Whose description? We have common friends, said Mr. Utterson. Common friends, echoed Mr. Hyde a little hoarsely. Who are they? Jekyll, for instance, said the lawyer. He never told you, cried Mr. Hyde with a flash of anger. I did not think you would have lied. Come, said Mr. Utterson, that is not fitting language. The other snarled aloud into a savage laugh, and the next moment, with extraordinary quickness, he had unlocked the door 
and disappeared into the house. The lawyer stood a while when Mr. Hyde had left him, the picture of disquietude. Then he began slowly to mount the street, pausing every step or two and putting his hand to his brow like a man in mental perplexity. The problem he was thus debating as he walked was one of a class that is rarely solved. Mr. Hyde was pale and dwarfish. He gave an impression of deformity without any nameable malformation. He had a displeasing smile. He had borne himself to the lawyer with a sort of murderous mixture of timidity and boldness, and he spoke with a husky whispering and somewhat broken voice. All these were points against him, but not all of these together could explain the hitherto unknown disgust, loathing and fear with which Mr. Utterson regarded him. There must be something else, said the perplexed gentleman. There is something more, if I could find a name for it. God bless me, the man seems hardly human. Something troglodytic, shall we say. Or can it be the old story of Dr. Fell? Or is it the mere radiance of a foul soul that thus transpires through and transfigures its clay continent? The last, I think, for, oh, my poor old Harry Jekyll, if I ever read Satan's signature upon a face, it is that on your new friend. Round the corner from the by-street there was a square of ancient handsome houses now, for the most part decayed from their high estate, and let in flats and chambers to all sorts and conditions of men. Map engravers, architects, shady lawyers, and the agents of obscure enterprise. One house, however, second from the corner, was still occupied entire, and at the door of this, which wore a great air of wealth and comfort, though it now plunged in darkness except for the fanlight, Mr. Utterson stopped and knocked. A well-dressed elderly servant opened the door. "'Is Dr. Jekyll at home, Poole?' asked the lawyer. "'I will see, Mr. Utterson,' said Poole, admitting the visitor as he spoke into a large, low-roofed, comfortable hall paved with flags, warmed after the fashion of a country house by a bright open fire, and furnished with costly cabinets of oak. "'Will you wait here by the fire, sir, or shall I give you a light in the dining-room?' "'Here, thank you,' said the lawyer, and he drew near and leaned on the tall fender. This hall, in which he was now left alone, was a pet fancy of his friend the doctor's, and Utterson himself was wont to speak of it as the pleasantest room in London. But tonight there was a shudder in his blood. The face of Hyde sat heavy on his memory. He felt, what was rare of him, a nausea and distaste of life, and in the gloom of his spirits he seemed to read a menace in the flickering of the firelight on the polished cabinets, in the uneasy starting of the shadow on the roof. He was ashamed of his relief when Paul presently returned to announce that Dr. Jekyll was gone out. "'I saw Mr. Hyde go in the old dissecting room, Paul,' he said. "'Is that right, when Dr. Jekyll is from home?' "'Quite right, Mr. Utterson, sir,' replied the servant. "'Mr. Hyde has a key. "'Your master seems to repose a great deal of trust in that young man, Paul,' resumed the other, musingly. "'Yes, sir, he does indeed,' said Paul. We have all orders to obey him. I do not think I've ever met Mr. Hyde, asked Utterson. Oh dear, no, sir. He never dines here, replied the butler. Indeed, we see very little of him on this side of the house. He mostly comes and goes by the laboratory. Well, good night, Paul. Good night, Mr. Utterson. And the lawyer set out homeward with a very heavy heart. Poor Harry Jackal, he thought. My mind misgives me that he is in deep waters. He was wild when he was young. A long while ago, to be sure, but in the law of God there is no statue of limitations. Ay, it must be that, the ghost of some old sin, the cancer of some concealed disgrace. Punishment coming. Years after memory has forgotten and self-love condoned the fault. And the lawyer, scared by the thought, brooded a while on his own past, groping in all the corners of memory least by some chance some jack-in-the-box of an old iniquity should leap to light there. His past was fairly blameless. Few men could read the rolls of their life with less apprehension. Yet he was humbled to the dust by the many ill things he had done, and raised up again into a sober and fearful gratitude by the many that he had come so near to doing yet avoided. And then, by a return on his former subject, he conceived a spark of hope, this master Hyde, if he were studied, thought he, must have secrets of his own, black secrets, by the look of him. 
Secrets compared to which poor Jekyll's worst would be like sunshine. Things cannot continue as they are. It turns me cold to think of this creature stealing like a thief to Harry's bedside. Poor Harry. What awakening. And the danger of it, for if this Hyde suspects the existence of the will, he may grow impatient to inherit. I must put my shoulders to the wheel, if Jekyll will let me. If Jekyll will only let me. For once more he saw before his mind's eye, as clear as transparency, the strange clauses of the will. A fortnight later, by excellent good fortune, the doctor gave one of his pleasant dinners to some five or six old cronies, all intelligent, reputable men, and all judges of good wine. Mr. Utterson so contrived that he remained behind after the others had departed. This was no new arrangement, but a thing that had befallen many scores of times. Where Utterson was liked, he was liked well. Hosts loved to detain the dry lawyer. When the light-hearted and loose-tongued had already their foot on the threshold, they liked to sit a while in his unobtrusive company, practicing for solitude, sobering their minds in the man's rich silence after the expense and strain of gaiety. To this rule, Dr. Jekyll was no exception. And as he now sat on the opposite side of the fire, a large, well-made, smooth-faced man of fifty, with something of a slyish cast, perhaps, but every mark of capacity and kindness, you could see by his looks that he cherished for Mr. Utterson a sincere and warm affection. "'I have been wanting to speak to you, Jekyll,' began the latter. "'You know that will of yours?' A close observer might have gathered that the topic was distasteful, but the doctor carried it off gaily. "'My poor Utterson,' said he, "'you are unfortunate in such a client. I never saw a man so distressed as you were by my will, unless it were that hide-bound pedant Lanyon, at what he called my scientific heresies. Oh, I know, he's a good fellow. You needn't frown. An excellent fellow. And I always mean to see more of him but a hide-bound pedant for all that. An ignorant, blatant pedant. And I was never more disappointed in any man than Lanyon. You know I never approved of it, pursued Utterson, ruthlessly disregarding the fresh topic. My will? Yes, certainly, I know that, said the doctor, a trifle sharply. You have told me so. Well, I tell you so again, continued the lawyer. I have been learning something of young Hyde. The large handsome face of Dr. Jekyll grew pale to the very lips, and there came a blackness about his eyes. I do not care to hear more, said he. This is a matter I thought we had agreed to drop. What I heard was abominable, said Utterson. It can make no change. You do not understand my position, returned the doctor with a certain incoherency of manner. I am painfully situated, Utterson. My position is a very strange, a very strange one. It is one of those affairs that cannot be mended by talking. Jekyll, said Utterson, you know me. I am a man to be trusted. Make a clean breast of this in confidence. And I make no doubt I can kick you out of it. My good Utterson, said the doctor. This is very good of you. This is downright good of you, and I cannot find words to thank you in. I believe you fully. I would trust you before any man alive. I, before myself, if I could make the choice, but... Indeed, it isn't what you fancy. It is not as bad as that, and just to put your good heart at rest, I will tell you one thing. The moment I choose, I can be rid of Mr. Hyde. I give you my hand upon that. And I thank you again and again, and I will just add one little word, Utterson. And I am sure you'll take in good part that this is a private matter, and I beg of you, let it sleep. Utterson reflected a little looking in the fire. I have no doubt that you are perfectly right, he said at last, getting to his feet. Well, since we have touched upon this business, and for the last time, I hope, continued the doctor, there is one point I should like you to understand. I have really a very great interest in poor Hyde. I know you have seen him, he told me, sir. I fear he was rude. 
but I do sincerely take a great, very great interest in that young man. If I am taken away, Utterson, I wish you to promise me that you will bear with him, get his rights for him. I think you would, if you knew all, and it would be a weight off of my mind if you would promise. I can't pretend I shall ever like him, said the lawyer. I don't ask that, pleaded Jekyll, laying his hand upon the other's arm. I only ask for justice. I only ask you to help him for my sake when I am no longer here. Utterson heaved an irrepressible sigh. Well, said he, I promise. Nearly a year later, in the month of October 18, London was startled by a crime of singular ferocity, rendered all the more notable by the high position of the victim. The details were few and startling. A maidservant living alone in a house not far from the river had gone upstairs to bed about eleven. Although a fog rolled over the city in the small hours, the early part of the night was cloudless, and the lane which was the maid's window overlooked was brilliantly lit by the full moon. It seemed she was romantically given, for she sat down upon her box, which stood immediately under the window and fell into a dream of musing. Never, she used to say with streaming tears when she narrated the experience. Never had she felt more at peace with all men, or thought more kindly of the world. And as she so sat, she became aware of an aged, beautiful gentleman with white hair, drawing near along the lane, and advancing to meet him, another very small gentleman, to whom at first she paid less attention. When they had come within reach, which was just under the maid's eyes, the older man bowed and accosted the other with a very pretty manner of politeness. It did not seem as if the subject of his address were of great importance. Indeed, from his pointing, it sometimes appeared as if he were only inquiring his way. But the moon shone on his face as he spoke, and the girl was pleased to watch it. It seemed to breathe such an innocent and old-world kindness of disposition. Yet, with something high, too, as of a well-founded self-content. Presently her eye wandered to the other, and she was surprised to recognize in him a certain Mr. Hyde, who had once visited her master and for whom she had conceived a dislike. He had in his hand a heavy cane, with which he was trifling, but he answered never a word, and seemed to listen with an ill-contained impatience. And then, all of a sudden, he broke out in a great flame of anger, stamping his foot, brandishing the cane, and carrying on, as the maid described it, like a madman. The old gentleman took a step back, with the air of one very much surprised, and a trifle hurt. And at that, Mr. Hyde broke out of all bounds and clubbed him to the earth. And next moment, with ape-like fury, he was trampling his victim underfoot, hailing down a storm of blows, under which the bones were audibly shattered. The body jumped upon the roadway. At the horror of these sights and sounds, the maid fainted. It was two o'clock when she came to herself and called for the police. The murderer was gone long ago, but there lay his victim, in the middle of the lane, incredibly mangled. The stick with which the deed had been done, although it was of some rare and very tough and heavy wood, had broken in the middle under the stress of this cruelty. One splintered half had rolled into the neighboring gutter, the other, without doubt, had been carried away by the murderer. A purse and a gold watch were found upon the victim, but no cards or papers, except a sealed and stamped envelope, which he had been probably carrying to the post, and bore the name and address of Mr. Utterson. This was brought to the lawyer the next morning, before he was out of bed, and he had no sooner seen it and been told the circumstances that he shot out a solemn lip. 
I shall say nothing until I've seen the body, said he. This may be very serious. Have the kindness to wait while I dress. And with the same grave countenance he hurried through his breakfast and drove to the police station. As soon as he came into the cell, he nodded. Yes, said he. I recognize him. I'm sorry to say that that is Sir Danvers Carew. Good God, sir, exclaimed the officer. Is it possible? The next moment his eye lighted up with professional ambition. This will make a deal of noise, he said. Perhaps you can help us to the man. He briefly narrated what the maid had seen and showed the broken stick. Mr. Utterson had already quailed at the name of Hyde. But when the stick was laid before him, he could doubt no longer. Broken and battered as it was, he recognized it for the one that he himself presented many years before to Henry Jekyll. Is this Mr. Hyde a person of small stature, he inquired? Particularly small, and particularly wicked-looking, is uh, what the maid calls him, said the officer. Mr. Utterson reflected, and then raising his head, If you'll come with me in my cab, he said, I think I can take you to his house. It was by this time about nine in the morning, in the first fog of the season. A great chocolate-coloured pole lowered over heaven, but the wind was continually charging, rooting these embattled vapours, so that as the cab crawled from street to street, Mr. Utterson beheld a marvellous number of degrees and hues of twilight, for here it would be dark like the back end of evening, and there would be a glow of a rich lurid brown, like the light of some strange conflagration. And here, for a moment, the fog would be quite broken up, and a haggard shaft of daylight would glance in between the swirling wreaths. The dismal quarter of Soho, seen under these changing glimpses with its muddy ways and slatternly passengers, and its lamps which had never been extinguished, or had been kindled afresh to combat this mournful reinvasion of darkness, seemed in the lawyer's eyes like a district of some city in a nightmare. The thoughts of his mind besides were of the gloomiest die, and when he glanced at the companion of his drive he was conscious of some touch of that terror of the law and the law's officers, which may at times assail the most honest. As the cab drew up before the address indicated, the fog lifted a little, and showed him a dingy street, a gin palace, a low French eating house, a shop for the retail of penny numbers and two penny salads, many ragged children huddled in doorways and many women of many different nationalities passing out, key in hand, to have a morning glass. The next moment the fog settled down again upon that part, as brown as umber, and cut him off from his blackguardly surroundings. This was the home of Henry Jekyll's favourite, of a man who was heir to a quarter of a million sterling. An ivory-faced and silvery-haired old woman opened the door, she had an evil face, smoothed by hypocrisy, but her manners were excellent. Yes, she said, this was Mr. Hyde's, but he was not at home. He had been in that night very late, but he had gone away again in less than an hour. There was nothing strange in that. His habits were very irregular. He was often absent, for instance. It was nearly two months since she had seen him till yesterday. Very well, then. We wish to see his rooms, said the lawyer. And when the woman began to declare it was impossible, I'd better tell you who this person is, he added. This is Inspector Newcomen of Scotland Yard. A flash of odious joy appeared upon the woman's face. Ah, said she, he is in trouble. What has he done? Mr. Utterson and the inspector exchanged glances. He don't seem a very popular character, observed the latter. And now, my good woman, just let me and this gentleman have a look about us. In the whole extent of the house, which but for the old woman remained otherwise empty, Mr. Hyde had only used a couple of rooms, but these were furnished with luxury and good taste. A closet was filled with wine. The plate was of silver, the napery elegant. 
a good picture hung upon the walls. A gift, as Utterson supposed, from Henry Jekyll, who was much of a connoisseur. The carpets were of many plies and agreeable in colour. At this moment, however, the rooms bore every mark of having been recently and hurriedly ransacked. Clothes lay about the floor, with their pockets inside out, lock-fast drawers stood open, and on the hearth lay a pile of grey ashes, as though many papers had been burned. From these embers the inspector disinterred the butt-end of a green checkbook, which had resisted the action of the fire. The other half of the stick was found behind the door, and as this clinched his suspicions, the officer declared himself delighted. A visit to the bank, where several thousand pounds were found to be lying to the murderer's credit, completed his gratification. "'You may depend upon it, sir,' he told Mr. Utterson. "'I have him in my hand. He must have lost his head, or he never would have left the stick, or above all burned the checkbook. Why, money's life to the man.' We've nothing to do but wait for him at the bank and uh, get out the handbills. This last, however, was not so easy of an accomplishment. Mr. Hyde had numbered few familiars. Even the master of the servant maid had only seen him twice. His family could nowhere be traced. He had never been photographed, and the few who could describe him differed widely, as common observers will. Only on one point that they agreed, and that was the haunting sense of unexpressed deformity with which the fugitive impressed his beholders. It was late in the afternoon when Mr. Utterson found his way to Dr. Jekyll's door, where he was at once admitted by Poole and carried down by the kitchen offices, across a yard which had once been a garden, to the building which was indifferently known as the laboratory or dissecting rooms. The doctor had bought the house from the heirs of a celebrated surgeon, his own tastes being rather chemical than anatomical, had changed the destination of the block at the bottom of the garden. It was the first time that the lawyer had been received in that part of his friend's quarters. He eyed the dingy windowless structure with curiosity and gazed round with a distasteful sense of strangeness as he crossed the theatre. Once crowded with eager students and now lying gaunt and silent, tables laden with chemical apparatus, the floor strewn with crates and littered with packing straw, the light falling dimly through the foggy cupola. At the further end, a flight of stairs mounted to a door covered with red, and through this Mr. Utterson was at last received into the doctor's cabinet. It was a large room fitted round with glass presses, furnished, among other things, with a shovel glass and a business table, and looking out upon the court by three dusty windows barred with iron. The fire burned in the grate, a lamp was set lighted on the chimney shelf, for even in the houses the fog began to lie thickly, and there close up to the warmth sat Dr. Jekyll, looking deathly sick. He did not rise to meet his visitor, but held out a cold hand, and bade him welcome, in a changed voice. And now, said Mr. Utterson, as soon as Poole had left them, you've heard the news? The doctor shuddered. They were crying it in the square, he said. I heard them in my dining room. One word, said the lawyer. Carew was my client, but so are you. And I want to know what I'm doing. You have not been mad enough to hide this fellow. Utterson, I swear to God, cried the doctor. I swear to God I will never set eyes upon him again. I bind my honour to you that I am done with him in this world. It is all at an end. Indeed, he does not want my help. You do not know him as I do. He is safe. He is quite safe. Mark my words. He will never more be heard of. The lawyer listened gloomily. He did not like his friend's feverish manner. You seem pretty sure of him, said he. 
For your sake, I hope you may be right. If it came to a trial, your name might appear. I am quite sure of him, replied Jekyll. I have grounds for certainty that I cannot share with anyone, but there is one thing on which you may advise me. I have received a letter, and I am at a loss whether I should show it to the police. I should like to leave it in your hands, Utterson. You would judge wisely, I am sure. I have so great a trust in you. You fear, I suppose, that it might lead to his detection? asked the lawyer. No, said the other. I cannot say that I care what becomes of Hyde. I am quite done with him. I was thinking of my own character, which this hateful business has rather exposed. Utterson ruminated a while. He was surprised at his friend's selfishness and yet relieved by it. Well, let me see the letter. The letter was written in an odd upright hand and signed Edward Hyde. It signified briefly enough that the writer's benefactor, Dr. Jekyll, whom he had long so unworthily repaid for a thousand generosities, need labor under no alarm for his safety as he had means of escape on which he placed a sure dependence. The lawyer liked this letter well enough. It put a better color on the intimacy than he had looked for and he blamed himself for some of his past suspicions. "'Have you the envelope?' he asked. "'I burned it,' replied Jekyll. "'Before I thought what I was about, but it bore no postmark, the note was handed in. "'Shall I keep this and sleep upon it?' asked Utterson. "'I wish you to judge for me entirely. "'I've lost confidence in myself.' "'Well, I shall consider,' returned the lawyer. "'And now one word more.' It was Hyde who dictated the terms in your will about that disappearance. The doctor seemed seized with a qualm of faintness. He shut his mouth tight and nodded. I knew it, said Utterson. He meant to murder you. You had a fine escape. I have had what is far more to the purpose, returned the doctor solemnly. I have had a lesson. Oh God, Utterson, what a lesson I have had. He covered his face for a moment with his hands. On his way out, the lawyer stopped and had a word or two with Poole. By the by, said he, there was a letter handed in today. What was the messenger like? Poole was positive nothing had come except by post, and only circulars by that, he added. This news sent off the visitor with his fears renewed. Plainly, the letter had come by the laboratory door. Possibly, indeed, it had been written in the cabinet. And if that was so, it must be differently judged and handled with more caution. The newsboys, as he went, were crying themselves hoarse along the footways. Special edition, shocking murder of an MP. That was the funeral oration of one friend and one client. He could not help a certain apprehension lest the good name of another should be sucked down in the eddy of the scandal. It was at least a ticklish decision that he had to make. But self-reliant as he was by habit, he began to cherish a longing for advice. It was not to be had directly, but perhaps he thought it might be fished for. Presently after, he sat on one side of his own hearth with Mr. Guest, his head clerk, upon the other, Midway between, at a nicely calculated distance from the fire, a bottle of a particular old wine that had long dwelt unsunned in the foundations of his house. The fog still slept on the wing above the drowned city, where the lamps glimmered like carbuncles, and through the muffle and smother of these fallen clouds, the procession of the town's life was still rolling in through the great arteries with a sound as of a mighty wind. But the room was gay with firelight. In the bottle, the acids were long ago resolved. The imperial dye had softened with time, and as the color grows richer in stained windows, and the glow of hot autumn afternoons on hillside vineyards was ready to be set free and to disperse the fogs of London. Insensibly, the lawyer melted. There was no man from whom he kept fewer secrets than Mr. Guest, and he was not always sure that he kept as many as he meant. 
guest had often been on business to the doctors. He knew Paul he could scarce have failed to hear of Mr. Hyde's familiarity about the house. He might draw conclusions. Was it not as well, then, that he should see a letter which put that mystery to right? And above all, since Guest, being a great student and critic of handwriting, would consider the step natural and obliging. The clerk, besides, was a man of counsel. He could scarce read so strange a document without dropping a remark, and by that remark Mr. Utterson might shape his future course. "'This is a sad business about Sir Danvers,' he said. "'Yes, sir. It's elicited a great deal of public feeling,' returned Guest. The man, of course, was mad. "'I'd like to hear your views on that,' replied Utterson. "'I have a document here in his handwriting. It's between ourselves, for I scarce know what to do about it. It is an ugly business at best, but there it is, quite in your way. A murderer's autograph. Guest's eyes brightened, and he sat down at once and studied it with passion. No, sir, he said, not mad, but it is an odd hand. And by all accounts a very odd writer, added the lawyer. Just then the servant entered with a note. Is that from Dr. Jekyll, sir? inquired the clerk. I thought I knew the writing. Anything private, Mr. Utterson? Uh, only an invitation to dinner. Why, do you want to see it? One moment. Thank you, sir. The clerk laid the two sheets of paper alongside, sedulously compared their contents. Thank you, sir, he said at last. It's a very interesting autograph. There was a pause, during which Mr. Utterson struggled with himself. "'Why did you compare them, guest?' he inquired suddenly. <clears throat> "'Well, sir,' returned the clerk, "'there's a rather singular resemblance. "'The two hands are in many points identical, only differently sloped.' "'Rather quaint,' said Utterson. "'It is, as you say, rather quaint,' returned guest." "'I wouldn't speak of this note, you know,' said the master. "'No, sir,' said the clerk. "'I, I understand.' "'No sooner was Mr. Utterson alone that night "'that he locked the note into his safe, "'where it reposed from that time forward. "'What?' he thought. "'Henry Jekyll forged for a murderer, "'and his blood ran cold in his veins.' And that is where we shall close the book on Jekyll and Hyde and on this week's episode of Down to Sleep. Thank you so much for joining me tonight.